So there's a bunch of big words there, um, but let me explain. So, let's get started. So I'm a huge nerd, and being a huge nerd, I really love robots. Um, it's probably embarrassing to say when you're in, um, on my birthday cake, rather than having the word Trent, I had the word robot. And that was my favorite cake ever, so I really love robots. And um, probably about once a week, or once every two weeks, uh, I go to Google and I type in the word robot or furry robot, or terminator robot, or elmo robot, or something, just to see the, the latest and greatest robots that are showing up in the web. It's actually really cool to do. Um, so this is an example of a bunch of, you know, you type in robot, some of the things you come up, and there's different varieties, real robots, human, drawing, clip art, and so on. And, uh, you know, if you're giving a talk with slides and so on, like this, um, I really care about compensating the creator, about attribution, all of that, right? I really want to stay on the right side of the law. Um, so if you filter to just the images that you are allowed to use and to modify, there's exactly one. Every single other image there, you can't use. There's, there's, um, it, there's no way to license it. It doesn't point to any license information. There's only one that is Creative Commons licensed. And it, it's you know this crappy old toy from when I was a kid, right? Um, that's not a very interesting robot. So um, thanks, but no thanks, right? And that, that's, that's too bad. So I, it's really hard for me to attribute someone um, or, or to use a, a, a photo legally. Um, so that's kind of one of the examples related to ownership. Now, um, I don't know if you guys remember back in the 2005-2007, this uh, Sony debacle uh, with rootkits. So let's say that you're a huge fan of Ricky Martin. Right? You guys remember Ricky Martin? Yeah? yeah? So let's say that you go, each and every one of you goes out and buys that next Ricky Martin CD. And I think the 2005 one is, let me see. The this is life. I think that's the one. Um, and so you go and buy it. You put it into your computer, and um, you play it. And you're you know, rocking along, rocking along, singing Ricky Morton, all good. And you know what's happening? It's a rootkit just got installed in your computer. It went down to the OS level, and it opened up backdoors for every hacker in the world. So there's a total of 22 million CDs that Sony shipped. And it wasn't just Ricky Morton. It was a whole bunch of other people, too, Celine Dion. Um, and Our Lady of Peace, which is this amazing Canadian rock band, so actually I did have that album, so I guess I got the root kit. Um, and uh, it's actually really sad, right? So boom, 22 million people got hacked because this wide open back door for, for um, hacking um, put there by Sony simply because they wanted to protect uh, their copies. They wanted to prevent people from making copies. And so it's this whole idea of digital rights management, right? DRM. It, it's, it has a bad name. And it deserves it. It deserves it because it's trying to fight the physics of bits. Okay, so DRM is trying to say you can't make copies, and it's like, okay, well, this is not how bits work. This is not how digital processing works, right? If I really want to make a copy of a, of a photo, I take the photograph. There, there's the analog hole. You can do that all the time, anytime with photographs, or with movies, or with sounds, with a microphone, all of these things, right? So no matter what fancy DRM um, system you have to prevent copying and all of that you've always got the analog hole. And it's never going to go away unless the universe goes away. So it's really a fallacy. It's really um, stick, stick, sticking your head in the sand to believe that DRM is a solution. And this is actually what has been happening over the last 20 years. People trying to do copy protection, copy protection, and it's failed. It's really failed. You know, very famously with Sony and the rootkits. Um, there's other challenges too, though, So um, out there with respect to ownership and the internet. So depending on how you count it, um, with respect to the, the music world, once again, there's, um, there were five gorillas, then there were four, and now there's three. Um, you know, Universal Music, Sony, and, and, and more, and they all have really big, sharp elbows. And so if you are a startup that wants to basically connect lovers of music um, with um, creators of music musicians, say you're SoundCloud, right? And you, you build this um, site up, and it's a really cool user interface and really fun to do. And then um, you build it, you build it, you get, you know, a, 10,000 users, you get a million, you get 10 million, you get 100 million, and then the labels come and sue you. And they want their five pounds of flesh. And what that means in real terms is a gigantic chunk of your company. That's exactly what's happening to SoundCloud as we speak, right? 
Um, so they're actually having a hell of a time making deals with the labels because the labels see that they can take their five pounds of flesh. Now, you know, part of the reason that SoundCloud didn't sort this out at the beginning is because it was hard. It's a really high barrier to entry in order to license work. Um, and you have to basically somehow know the CEO of Universal Music to cut a deal with him, and Sony and the rest. So you, you have basically all this copyrighted work but, you know, by really talented musicians, and it's locked up by these giant corporations. So it, it's really a challenge. Another example, Spotify did go to their way in the beginning when they started. They sold their five pounds of flesh. So the music companies own, own a major chunk of, of Spotify, right? So um, it's, it's kind of too bad that the system works this way. You know, I live in Germany. Um, alas, I'm not a German speaker, so I really want to watch um, really seamless movies online at home. Can I legally? Nope. Not at all. I go to, YouTube, um, I go to iTunes, uh, and it detects my region, and it gives me overdubbed in German, and there's no subtitles. Same thing with um, Amazon. I go to Netflix, it's not new release. So the only way that I can actually get a new release movie online is via the torrents. And I don't do that. Um, I used to a long time ago, um, and I actually didn't like myself for it, but I can see why people would do it. And in general, you know, if your uh, friend sends me links with YouTube from Canada and stuff, and I get this uh, thing, this video is not available in your country, right? So um, once again, it's a problem with DRM clashing with user needs, right? So we have this terrible user experience on the web um, across all these different domains, and it's all sort of symptoms of the same root problem, and that is ownership of digital property on the web is broken. Um, and it's actually not just the internet, sometimes it's even off the internet. So if you're an artist, right? So if you're an artist, you know, in this day and age, it's 2015, age of digital, age of knowledge. If you're a, a modern artist, you, you very likely could be creating digital art. So this is, you know, born digital, soul digital, all of that. Uh, here's an example of a piece by Jonathan Monahan. It's, it's a video, it's, this is a still from the video, of course. And um, this, this work sells for about $10,000 for one edition. Okay. Now, um, in the art world, let, let's say that um, I, I buy this from Jonathan through his gallery, and then I want to go and sell it again. The very first question people will ask me is, how do I know that you didn't download this from the torrents? How do I know that you own this? And I won't have a good answer. Maybe I'll have some sort of like um, certificate of authenticity, but um, it's just going to be very ad hoc and, and silly that the gallery just kind of wrote up, right? Um, and it's, you know, so the workaround that Jonathan and others have been doing is putting it onto a USB stick, but not just any USB stick, a fancy one, and putting it in a fancy box, and basically trying to convert this thing that is naturally digital into something more physical and analog, which is really kind of silly, right? Imagine every time you want to watch a YouTube video, you have to package it up in a box and get it mailed to you, right? It doesn't make sense. So why should art be like that? And in the art world, actually, it's been called an elephant in the room problem. And if you go to the different art conferences where there's like panelists and all this, for the, both the past five years, there's always at least one panel or talk where talk, people talk about the problem of ownership of digital art. So it's this really, really big problem. Um, 3D printing designs too. You know, a lot of people, um, if you go to the, the, the forums of Shapeways, which is the, the number one consumer 3D printing site out there, um, you'll see um, posts like this. My conclusion is that whatever you put on the internet, you lose it. Maybe keep the rights, but lose the power over it. So what's happening is, really great creators, designers of 3D objects, etc., aren't putting their stuff out there because they, they lose it. Lose it as in lose power over it. So to summarize all these overall problems, there's really kind of two zones on the internet. There's this copyright zone, the fortified, restricted, difficult to reuse, difficult to share part. And then there's this public domain ocean, which is open and it's unrestricted use. But the problem is, a lot of this material is inferior or outdated. Right? So a lot of it is great, but a lot of it isn't. So overall, it's a mess. Right? For creators, um, it's hard to get compensated. There's no visibility into the usage. If you share, it means you lose control, so you don't even bother. Uh, if you're a collector, you can't even truly own digital objects, which means you can't resell, you only have limited rights. And if you're a connector, well, how are you handling these customers' concerns? Uh, uh, your customers are the creators and the collectors. And what about those legals and all of that, too? And if you look at it, once again, throw a stone, you'll find a problem. Um, this is the root cause. Every single vertical from digital art, photography, and so on. You can summarize this problem as, where's my stuff? And that breaks down into two things. The my stuff part is basically, uh, it's really painful to sort of the legals, uh, what it is to be mine, you know, truly owning something. 
And the where's is having no visibility into what's going on and where things are being shared. So let's just take a you know, step backwards and ask why is this happening? Uh, so let's look at some history of the World Wide Web. So rewind to just 1989, only 26 years ago. And there was this researcher at, at CERN named Tim Berners-Lee. And in March of 1989, he made a proposal to his boss to do um, something called a hypertext system, going back to some research from the 60s. And um, his boss said, yeah, that sounds kind of cool. Go for it, Tim. Why not? It sounds kind of cool, right? So a year and a half later, uh, Christmas 1990, Tim Berners-Lee had rolled out the world's first uh, web server, the world's first, um, basically everything you need for, for the web. So HTTP and um, a browser and the server and all the protocols in between. And he basically did it all kind of by himself. Now that said, he was standing on the shoulders of many things done before, obviously. There was the whole internet before. I'll get into that. But the World Wide Web um, only came along in 1989, finally released 1990. And it, what happened? It took off like crazy, right? Billions and billions um, um, of pages, and it's just kind of this you know, whole universe out there that we all kind of dreamed of in the 80s and 90s, and it's actually here now. And everyone can safely say that it's transformed almost every aspect of society, which is pretty awesome, right? So let's think about this, you know, going to the root of the problem. So let's take some, some art and uh, put it on the net. So here's a, a robot, of course, this is me, so this is one of Trent's robots. And um, so if I took there that and I put it on a web page, right, as an image, what will happen? Well, people could copy it and put it on their own web pages, and they cannot attribute me, and I'll never know about it. Maybe I can Google reverse image search, but I really have to do that actively. Um, so there's going to be no attribution. Or they can attribute me, but I can't stop them from copying it and pasting it or anything. I don't have any sort of visibility, once again, unless I'm really active about it. Or even worse, um, someone might take a copy of a copy and attribute it to the wrong person. And this happens all the time, right? If you actually follow this stuff, you'll see um, news articles about problems like this every three or four days, right? There's something related to copying and, and copyright, etc. So to summarize once again, it's this problem where we're trying to solve of where's my stuff? There's no visibility, and it's painful legals, right? Um, and, you know, about the World Wide Web on this, uh, Here's a quote from Jeff Atwood of the Coding Horror Blog, which is a really great blog, by the way. I encourage all of you, especially the hackers in here. The current World Wide Web does basically one thing. Simple, stupid, mindless hyperlinks. But even that alone was enough to build a functional and useful internet for the world. And that's actually pretty incredible if you think about it. So, but we might ask, does it really need to be this way? So what's the history of the internet, you know, pre-World Wide Web? Is there, does, does anyone else have anything to say? Any other previous thinkers? So let's go back to a vision from 1965, a guy named Ted Nelson. Consider a unified service that would provide storage and publication services and manage royalty payments on a fair basis that would facilitate unrestricted virtual republishing. 1965. Pretty cool, eh? And actually, he envisioned what this might look like. Right? A new middle realm, so a middle realm between this idea of copyright, the restricted copyright zone, and the unrestricted public domain zone. And this um, middle realm, he called it the trans-publishing zone, but anyway, it's a funny word. But in there, anything can be quoted or republished or, 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 or without prearrangement or difficulty, yet retaining copyright and copyright benefits. So this new middle realm, one which renders copyright benign and flexible, a win-win system, as it's beneficial to both rights holders and to users, in a way that other copyright systems are not. So here's the funny thing, right? Mostly when we think about intellectual property, um, we hear about like evil patents, or we hear about big evil corporations wielding their copyright badly, right? But what if actually copyright could be used as a tool? A tool for individuals, right? What if it was super accessible in a way that any individual could just use it without thinking, as easy as sending an email, okay? And this is actually what, what Ted Nelson was imagining. So copyright in a way where it's just built into the system, and it's just there, and it's benefiting everybody out of the box. So the design, he called the system Xanadu, and the design basically had two aspects. It had bidirectional links, and it had baked in copyright. So the bidirectional links are basically, rather than just page A pointing to page B, page B also points back to page A all the time, all the time, built into the protocol, right? The second thing is the baked in copyright. So it's just there, right? And this was, like I said, proposed in 1965. And um, it actually 
addresses these problems, right, of the where's my stuff. The where's, it's got the visibility into where your content shows up because it's actually got that bi-directional links. The my stuff, it's got the baked-in copyright. So that's actually handling. Copyright is the, the, the piece of intellectual property law um, about um, creations related to like music and sound and all of this, um, sort of creative works, right? So um, it's actually handled and it's, it's just there and it solves this problem of where's my stuff? And so the history of Xanadu, you might ask, well, what happened to Xanadu, right? 1965 to now, I mean, that's been a long time, what's going on? So um, Ted Nelson, you know, he was a researcher and he managed to get some funding to, to chase this and uh, he did a, uh, got to the point of a mock-up with, um, you know, a prototype with computing in 1972 and we can see here he's got the bidirectional links going. Um, and he kept building it and building it and building it. Um, you know, by 1968, he'd added in these other um, aspects, things like the metastructure level and the construct level, with things like transclusions. So it was starting to get a little creaky with complexity, right? And in fact, it's complexity that, that killed the cat in this case. So what happened in the end, it was so complex um, that, you know, in the 80s actually, um, they had started a company, um, AutoCAD, um, the company that builds AutoCAD, Autodesk, um, bought them, they built it up more, um, but it was so complicated that it just took forever to really ship, and it never really even fully shipped in a big way. It's actually been considered uh, one of the longest histories of vaporware ever, so it even beat be a nu nu nukem forever. <laughs> so um, that's quite a feat, right? Uh, so it's really complex, hard to build, and then along came the simpler World Web, right, in 1990. And it took off, just like immediately, within a couple of years, and uh, along came the web browser with Mark Andreessen and all this, it's a boom, right? So um, Autodesk shut down the Xanadu project in the early 90s because it was pretty clear that um, uh, the World Wide Web protocol and software had won out. So now, here in 2015, we have the World Wide Web, warts and all. We have zero links, we have unidirectional links, but no ownership, etc., etc. And Ted Nelson has this awesome quote, HTML is precisely what we are trying to prevent, ever breaking the links, no rights management, right? So, um, you know, he's actually, if you read at some of his writings from recently, he's somewhat bitter about it. But at the same time, you might ask, what's he doing now? So I actually reached out to him, I emailed him, and I said, hey, you know, we're actually building towards your vision. Um, we'd love to, I'd love to chat and maybe see if we can collaborate. And he's like, no, 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 I'm going to do it all by myself. We're, we're working on it. We're going to get it out there. We're going to get it out there. But, you know, you have to give the guy credit for tenacity, right? 50 years worth of tenacity. So, like, full kudos to Ted Nelson. And by the way, uh, the Zanity project was the original hypertext um, um, uh, project. He actually coined the term. And even when Tim Berners-Lee did World Wide Web, he referenced the Zanity project very heavily. So um, full of kudos, uh, Ted Nelson did have a big influence on the computing world, just not in quite the way he hoped. So, so far, let, let's think about where we are, right? So ownership of digital property is a mess, especially for the citizens of the internet. And it was, it's funny because it was anticipated since the 60s, and even designed for it, right? But the World of Web, its simplicity went out, and it left this question, where's my stuff? It left it unresolved. So we've been asking a new question. Can we retrofit the internet for ownership? And can we realize the aims of Xanadu in the process? Not the design, just the aims, right? So that's the question we've been asking ourselves. So here's the core idea. Two things. Automatically discover the bidirectional links. And easy, secure legals. So basically, we have the World Wide Web, where it's unidirectional links. But you can find a way to discover them the other direction. I'll talk about that. I'll talk about both. Okay. So this is, in a sense, if there's one slide you're going to remember from my talk tonight, this is the one. Okay. So this is the ascribe idea. Let's see it. So, um, to answer this question, where's my stuff, the, the automatic bidirectional links is what answers the where's, and the my stuff is answered by easy and secure legals, and each of those words matters. So let's, let's zoom into detail. So the where's part, um, how, how, how do we do this? So all the web. Now that sounds like kind of insane and crazy, right? Um, so I should give a bit of background. I spent the last 20 years in semiconductors where we were routinely handling um, sets of data points where there was 10 million, 100 billion plus data points. And um, we ha had to analyze these data points, dimension 10,000, which is similar to web pages, um, in 10 minutes on a laptop. 
So it's like, okay, I'm a circuit designer, I'm designing a memory chip, I have 10 minutes, I want you to come back and tell me what this chip is doing. So that's actually the scale of web problems. You have typically 4 billion to 10 billion web pages that you really want to look at. Depending how you count, depending how deep you want to go, there's 100 billion or more. But there's really on the order of 10 billion pages that really matter. And um, so uh, it's actually a similar shape of problem to what I'm used to. So in a, in a, it's actually smaller. Sometimes I was doing 100 billion data points. So in a sense, web, easy peasy. It's not quite that way, of course, but it it's, wasn't daunting because of, the, of my experience and the rest of the team that we built around us. So we have other people who have done a lot of machine learning at scale, a lot of big data. So, um, so we crawl the internet. It works out to 220 terabytes of text. Um, then we similarly match that against the creator's content. So this is um, machine learning type algorithms for, um, it's like reverse image search type stuff. We're doing it for images, and actually we're doing it for 3D designs to start out. Um, this is actually a technology, as far as I know, we're the only company in the world that does this. Uh, once again, we have the sort of like numerical um, mathematician, engineers, these sorts of people. This is sort of all in a day's work. Uh, so, and overall, this is about um, to know when someone is using your work. So the where part, right? So this is half of the, uh, or a portion of the solution. The other portion is the my stuff. And there's two parts to the my stuff. Easy legals and secure legals. So easy is via a terms of service that has a baked in contract. And this is actually the heart of the matter, right? So if you think about it, um, where does the law occur, right? The law occurs in contracts. It doesn't occur in the blockchain. It occurs in contracts between people or organizations, right? And those contracts can be written by lawyers that, um, who know the legal code, etc. And then they can be put into a terms of service and they can be legally binding, right? And so this is actually what we've done. We actually have a full-time copyright lawyer who has lived in Greek copyright law and privacy law for the last 10 years. So what this means in general is when you register a work on the Ascribe system, you are claiming that you have the copyright to that work. Um, and equally easily, you can say, I want to transfer this work to someone else. And that amounts to bequeathing uh, a set of rights to that next owner, such that they can resell it, such that they can display it publicly, etc., etc. And it's as easy as sending an email, clicking a button. So you can call it copyright in a box. And actually, it's a, a mix of, of copyright law and contract law. And we did that because copyright law actually has some variants among different nations, so you actually have to use some of contract law. So we've done that. Uh, the second part, so really the magic, the very, very heart of everything happening here for the actual um, transfer of ownership of digital property comes down to the contract that's embedded in the terms of service, okay? But um, when that contract happens, do you want to actually just store it in uh, Ascribe's database and then trust Ascribe? Well, you could, and you know, a lot of consumers do this. When you buy with Apple on iTunes, you're kind of trusting their database. But um, instead of that, why not use a database that the world trusts and means that you don't need to trust a scribe? Because I'm super corrupt. <laughs> um, so, but re um, really, and that's basically what the blockchain is, right? It's this database that no one owns, no one controls, or equivalently, everyone owns. You can write things to it, and once you write things to it, they never go away. So that's what basically we're doing. Every time one of these ownership transactions happen, happens, we're uh, recording that transaction on the blockchain. And we've come up with a special protocol for this. I, um, which in, it supports things like unique additions, consigning, and loaning. But at the core, it's not about a, a, a token of value going from person to person to person. It's about recording that an ownership action happened. Because the magic, once again, is the contract. And by the way, uh, and a thing we were worrying about like a year ago and plus was, okay, can the blockchain be admitted in court? Right? Um, can it be used as evidence in a court of law? And um, I have to thank Silk Road for doing a service to the blockchain world um, for um, resolving this issue. So when the Ross Elbert trial was happening, um, the jury, um, the evidence was present, pre presented um, using the blockchain. And it was basically um, accepted as evidence um, towards indicting uh, Ross Elbert. And if you think about it, it shouldn't be that surprising, right? Because we've actually had hard drives as evidence for a number of decades now. And you can think of the blockchain as a, a more tamper-resistant hard drive, so it should be even easier to trust for, for juries. And in this case, it was. So that's actually pretty cool, right? We've actually got courts of law that are actually accepting the blockchain as, a, as evidence. Uh, to zoom in on a couple of these things, the easy legals. So here's a snippet of our terms of service. We've gone way to our way to make it really simple. Of course, there's still a bit of legalese, but we've really um, go to our way. 
and uh, the, the protocol. And I'm going to get into more detail on the protocol here. Um, but the protocol, we call it the SPOOL, so Secure Public Online Ownership Ledger. Uh, we open sourced um, the pro this protocol onto GitHub, um, under github.com slash describe. And really, the, the core of the protocol, actually, I'll get into that in, in future slides. So our overall tech stack looks like the following. Um, at the very bottom, uh, there's you know solving two things, right? Automatically discovering the bidirectional links and the easy secure legals. So the bidirectional links, that's um, the first thing you have it in gray on the bottom left there is this giant database called the internet. You can think of it like that. You crawl it, you spider it, whatever. And um, that's one level above. And then uh, for the easy secure legals, you have the terms of service, which has the baked in copyright. And then you have the blockchain substack. So on the very bottom, you've got the actual database called the blockchain. You've got the protocol on top of the blockchain called the Bitcoin protocol. You've got the protocol on top of that, which is called Spool, and it's basically a subdialect of, of Bitcoin protocol. And then we actually have a Python implementation of that called PySpool, and we've open sourced all of that. So, um, and then we have our own servers um, sitting on top of this, and this is all served up as an API. And at the very, very top, on the top right, we have a web app that people can use for free, actually, um, for creators, galleries, all this sort of thing. And on the left, uh, for marketplaces. So third-party marketplaces can come in and sell digital property. And I'll talk a bit, of, bit more about that too. So that's the overall stack. And there's basically four interfaces, so for different sorts of people who might want to use this in various ways. So if you are an adventurous Bitcoin hacker, you can go and um, work at this level of the, the school protocol itself. You can go in there and kind of look and play around and see what's going on. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the protocol now. Uh, a few slides. So there's two main transactions. There's registering, which is claiming that you have copyright of a work, and there is transferring, which is um, transferring ownership from person A to person B. You know, a collector buys from an artist, or collector B buys from collector A. And um, so the register part, it's got um, one input, which is the ascribed address, and several outputs. The very first output is a hash of the work. So this is like the fingerprint, the signature of the work. It's a cryptographic hash. Um, and then, let's say that you have three editions. So, um, in the world of art, you want to actually have unique editions, okay? Just like photography back in the day, et cetera, et cetera. This is really important. And it even goes back to like bronze sculptures and so on, right? So, um, if you have three editions, then you would have one address for each of those three editions. And, and then you have um, two more outputs. You have an output for um, just declaring that you're registering this. It's an operator, it's like a comic, basically. And um, change, of course, because of you know, that particular quirk of Bitcoin. So this is a, a registered transaction, and um, what's cool is there's, there's some properties that emerge from this. Um, I'll get to that in a second. But the second um, transaction is transferring ownership. So it goes from the old owner's address for that piece to the new owner's. It's as simple as that. So, um, and you can sort of summarize this part of the protocol as the first time any Bitcoin leaves the existing owner's address, the ownership is transferred to the output, the, the new address, not all that I meant to see address here. And, um, and by the way, with all of this, uh, we don't have to store any private uh, keys or anything, um, yet the user doesn't actually have to store these super long keys either. Uh, the way that our system works, it's using HD wallets, so it's actually doing a deterministic function of the user's password into all these different addresses. So um, there is a best of both worlds, you don't have to say, I, um, I have to trade off security versus um, convenience for users. I think you can have your cake and eat it too. We are, and I know others in the space are doing this too. So we're not storing any passwords, we're not storing any private keys, and the user only has to remember his password. And that's possible with HD wallets. So a couple um, interesting things um, emerging from this protocol. First of all, provenance. So provenance is the history of ownership. It emerges naturally in this protocol. So what I have up above here is a register function on the left, and then uh, one ownership transfer going from owner 1 to owner 2, another one from 2 to 3, another one from 3 to 4. Um, it's pseudonymous, of course, because of the way that Bitcoin addresses work. Um, maybe at some point it will be totally um, open and non-anonymous to pay in research, and people have to be okay with that. In the world of art, that's okay. So, um, provenance emerges naturally, and this is actually really important to the, to the world of art. If you have a, an artwork, um, I mean, there's lots of examples from the Netherlands where, you know, someone has a Van Gogh as part of their stool and it's sitting there for 50 years, and then they recover it, and it's like, is this a Van Gogh? I don't know, I don't know, so they sell it for 10 grand, and then they do a bunch more forensic analysis and they realize, oh my god, it really is, and now it's worth 50 million, right? So, in that case, the provenance was recovered, right? But, um, in, in general, it's much better to just have provenance the whole way through, 
And especially with digital, um, how, it's much harder to do sort of forensic analysis of like this, right? So um, with the blockchain, we're actually getting perfect digital provenance. So the, um, because of the blockchain, we went from zero provenance for digital to perfect provenance for digital. So we think that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing uh, related to this is um, each edition of a work gets a unique ID. And I mentioned this, and that ID, we've just defined it simply as it's the Bitcoin address of the original owner. So if it changes ownership, um, you know, goes from one owner to the next to the next, the ID is still there as the very first address that owned it. Because then you basically, it's like a serial number, all that, right? A vehicle identification number, so now you have this for digital objects out of the box. And um, the other thing that's related to this, of course, by being in the very same transaction um, of the hash of the work, it's permanently binding that ID to um, the work itself. And, and basically it's saying, at this point in time, um, this address, um, this person was able to uh, access this file. So this is the binding, um, and it basically there for all eternity, or blockchain eternity. So that kind of summarizes the, the school protocol, that's pr protocol two of um, one and four. Um, one level up is the implementation of the protocol in Python. So you can once again go to GitHub there and check it out. It's called PySchool. Um, we also actually ended up, we were using three different Bitcoin libraries um, in Python to implement um, this under the hood, a bit of Py Bitcoin tools, a bit of Py, um, PyCoin, and I forget the third. So, but we were using like four functions or three functions from each. So we just um, merged them on and used what we needed. Uh, and now we have basically like a one page um, Python library called transactions. And it's just a very simple way to, to basically conduct transactions on the blockchain and sort of construct your own very simply. So that's also open source um, on GitHub. Uh, interface three, this is starting to get to the user level. So um, if you are a marketplace trying to sell digital goods, art, photography, whatever, um, now you can simply tie into a scribe and, and use us. So you don't have to know anything about blockchain. It's basically just like you tie into PayPal or Stripe to do payment processing so that you don't have to think about Visa and MasterCard and all of that, and you use OAuth and all this restful stuff. Same thing here. So now you use OAuth to set your identity, and then you call do a single API call, and you've registered a work. You do another API call, and you've transferred ownership. So it's simple as that. It's you know simpler than tying to PayPal or Stripe, and now you get ownership processing. And uh, finally, the very, very top is our web app. So this is an app that's out there on ascribe.io, and um, it's for individual creators. So people who want to register their work to claim that they had um, that they have copyright on it. Um, and also, if they want to consign it, they can consign it to galleries to sell on their behalf. Um, they can transfer ownership to others, and so on. So it's also useful for galleries, it's also useful for collectors. Um, and also, by the way, it just, this, this kind of came out. So storage these days is super cheap, right? I mean, thanks to Moore's Law, uh, storage is divided by two every year for cost. So this year, um, I can spend 100 euros and get one terabyte. Next year, I'll get two terabytes. The year after, four terabytes, right? So, but already it's ridiculously cheap, so we're just storing all the stuff in the cloud, it's not a big deal, and it just makes it really convenient for the users, because now they're getting archival. And once again, this is the sort of thing that people talk about all the time in the art shows, they go on and on about archival and all this. It actually really matters, right? Um, you know, there's, um, you, you can actually have a career as an archivist, right? And um, if you're in the art world, you know, there's curators, there's um, museologists, there's gallerists, and there's archivists, and others. And, um, they have to think about preservation, you know, like those five and a quarter inch floppies that I was programming on when I was a kid, they're all dead now, right? But what's cool is, if you have this stuff in the cloud, um, as the formats change, um, then they get automatically updated. Even with our app, as soon as someone uploads a movie, we automatically convert to the most modern video format so that it renders directly in HTML5, right? And we have, uh, because we're using cloud-based storage, S3, um, it actually makes um, copies, you know, automatically three copies, a replication factor of three. So you don't have to worry about your hard drive dying and all that. So it sounds like trivial to a hacker, but to um, a person in the art world, um, this archival that's just built in is actually a godsend. So a uh, very quick overview of what a scribe does. So you can go to the landing page, and um, it talks about um, we can help you manage valuable digital creations. You click sign up, and you just have to enter your email and a password and agree to the terms of service. You can click on the link for the terms of service, of course, to read more. 
and then you're in. And when you get inside, uh, you can um, the main thing you can do is to um, drop a file in. So drag a file in there, choose it to upload, and then you enter the artist name, the title, the year created, and you can specify the number of editions. You can either do that now or later. So three editions or a hundred, whatever. Okay. So very straightforward um, as a web app. And then so once you've registered, this is what you might look at. So this is the piece detail for a work. In this case, it's a work I bought from an artist named Dan Perjowski. And it's edition 3 of 100. Um, you can see it's got an ID on the top right. Um, I'm the owner. I'm trying to describe that IO. So right now, the pointer to identity is my email. Um, and I, can, I have some actions there, right? You see, I can tra click transfer. I can consign it. I can loan it. I can share it. And I can delete it. Now, of course, I can't delete it off the blockchain. But if I delete it here, then it kind of means I just don't care about it anymore, right? So I can kind of let go. Um, and there's other details too. You can see the certificate of authenticity and some more stuff. I'll show some details there. So once I um, start collecting more works or registering more works, you basically have your own collection of work, right? So I've actually been collecting art. It's actually really fun. Um, my wife and I have collected art for years, but it's been physical and it's actually in these storage lockers all over the world. We've got some stuff in Vancouver. We've got some stuff in New York. And now this is fantastic because actually I'm just it's it's in the cloud and it's just behind my password and that's it. So I've got work um, by different artists: Dan Perjowski, Edwin Rosero, Ella Frost, and Harm van der Dorpel, and many people. And I'm pretty happy about that. I'm actually building up a digital collection. And to transfer ownership, I guess I mentioned this. I just clicked on the transfer button. I type in an email. I can send my own message. I click. Um, I enter my password, and this is key, right? So by me entering the password here. Um, it's deterministically computing the private key for that address and um, sending it over, right? So that's um, uh, how we avoid having to store passwords and private keys. Yeah? That password you type in there, yeah. that's you press transfer, and yeah. that's, uh, that password gets sent to your server. It's actually, and most of it's happening in JavaScript, so, and you can look at the JavaScript, right? So it's a, I mean, client side. Most of it or all of it, because that's, that's important. Yeah, yeah, so um, I actually can't tell you directly right now. I don't know, I haven't seen the latest stuff. But I, I totally recognize what you mean. And for sure, it's really important to have um, everything in the client side, of course, right? Um, and the reason I don't know for sure, even though it's really important, is because most people don't care, right? Now, I care, and this is why we make a point of doing all of this stuff really well, right? Mm -hmm. But um, um, in general, this is how it, how it works, right? And overall, though, once again, this is sort of a, a way where you can make things really convenient for your users without compromising security. Right? So transfer with the click of a button. Now here's a funny thing, right? I gave you guys a very brief demo, like non-live, but while this app uses Bitcoin, you don't have to know Bitcoin at all. Did you see anything like that? No? Um, but of course, you can. Um, so if you want, you can cross-check. So if you click on the school details, um, it gives the ID of the artwork, um, which is um, for this edition of the work. It gives the hash of it. And it shows the, the school address that's owning it. And if you click on any one of these, I know someone will like this. So, uh, so shout out to Blocktrail. So um, we really like your guys' stuff, so we're using it. So great, great. And yeah, it links to, it links to the Blocktrail stuff. And actually, that links back to Ascribe, too. So, um, so basically, it's going back and forth. You can see on external third-party um, blockchain explorers what's going on. Uh, so just to kind of get near to the end of my talk, I um, just wanted to show you guys some examples of usage. So this Jonathan Monahan piece that I showed you guys before, uh, he's actually ascribing all of his stuff. He's very happy with us. Um, and uh, so he's actually, this is actually at Bitforms New York, which was one of the world's first um, digital art galleries. It's been going since uh, the 90s. Um, and uh, actually what's funny, a lot of the major digital art gallerists of the world, they're all named Steve. So in this case, it's Steve Sachs. Um, just kind of a funny aside. So um, Jonathan um, is, is this artist working with Steve, the, um, the gallerist, and collectors are buying this ascribed digital work through the gallery system, through this traditional gallery system. Ten thousand dollars a crap. Right? Um, we're actually working with a lot of different art prizes. It turns out that it's not it didn't take too much to tweak our system to allow artists to um, upload their work and ascribe it um, and register for a, an art prize at the same time. And one of the things, it's actually funny, if you're an artist, you're hesitant to enter your work for an art prize because what if someone sees it and steals your idea? So now, you don't have to worry. You've actually proven that you have had the idea here, it's on the blockchain, all of that. So, um, in this case, for the Berlin Art Prize, this is a, um, in, I think, March or so, uh, 350 artists used it to register 600 works. 
And since then, we've actually worked with several art prizes, including uh, Sluice, Sideline, and, and others. So this is something we're continuing to do. Um, there's galleries, uh, online art, digital art galleries that are using us. So this is an example of Coin Temporary. Um, you guys are like this because um, they sell art for Bitcoin. So you can't buy with uh, fiat, you have to use Bitcoin. The general concept is once every 10 days they have a new piece that comes up. And for the first year or two they've actually been selling only physical art, but they've been waiting and waiting and waiting for someone to crop us artists that are docking the system. Um, Creative Commons. So a lot of times people have asked us, you know, what about Creative Commons? Do you guys contact? How does it work? Well, we're actually totally complementary. So Creative Commons, um, at the core of it is licenses, right? It's licenses declaring how someone can use your work for free. Maybe you can use it if you give attribution, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, we've actually been working with Creative Commons France, and there's a specially um, branded site called cc.ascribe.io. You go there, and you can actually upload your work, and then you can choose a Creative Commons license with which to use it. So basically you're claiming that you have the copyright and then you're um, de declaring um, exactly how other people in the world can use it for free. Um, also actually promotions for limited digital editions. This is something kind of cool. So recently there's this author from London, a uh, sci-fi author, and he actually created 25 limited edition digital copies of his new novel, Solar Versia, to give to his fans. So, um, and they actually were given away in like 12 hours. It was really cool actually. And by the way, this novel is really cool. It's actually Bitcoin in the novel. So it's, it's the loop closed. So we were pretty happy with that. Uh, another example, um, museums are actually starting to engage with this as well. So Map Vienna, which is older than Canada, um, bought a, a scribe digital art and added it to its collection. So we're pretty happy with that. There's other museums following suit. Um, other promotions, there's a company called Titanium Comics. And they are, um, their, their number, Titanium, um, the atomic number is 22. So they ascribed 22 limited editions, and they're promoting that. Um, and another one that's kind of fun, Decentralized Dance Party, um, which is, it's amazing, I don't even know what else to say. It's sort of like a super happy street festival sort of thing that, that just sort of emerges spontaneously, like a flash mob, and guys dressing, you know, 80s ghetto blasters, dancing, dancing, dancing. And um, for promotions, they're actually doing limited edition digital posters and some more stuff. And by the way, um, if you guys are interested in this at all, I encourage you guys to Google it. And they're actually doing a European tour of four, four cities, including London, and then Paris, and then Berlin, and then I forget the fourth. But um, come to Berlin, it, uh, Greece, I think that's right. Yeah, so it's going to be super cool. Um, you know, this is an example of a shot. Um, so I really encourage you guys to check this out. Um, and also, of course, um, creators can, can track what's going on, right? So uh, this is an example from our similar research results where um, it actually compares to the web that we've crawled, so we've got over a billion images in there. Um, you enter an image, and, and it spits out um, in under a second um, what the other similar images are. So we've actually figured out the scaling here and doing it really fast, and once again, this draws on our machine learning background to do it really fast and at scale. Um, and actually, what's kind of funny, this isn't our landing page anymore, but we were uh, wanting to have an image for a landing page, and it's like, okay, we want to, you know, this is artists we liked, we wanted some of our images, so it's like, what do we do? How do we do the licensing? It's like, oh yeah, we can use ourselves. So we did. So she registered her work, and then um, I sent money to her. She wanted PayPal, not Bitcoin, so I sent her PayPal. But then she transferred ownership to Ascribe. Um, so we actually um, got the legal right to use the web page using ourselves, and we were pretty happy about that. Um, and actually, there's a lot of different users, right? A lot of individual digital artists, photographers, other creatives. Um, there's a 3D design marketplace, and others actually starting to use us there for the 3D similarity search. Um, art marketplaces, and actually some people are starting to build on top of our API as well. So, interestingly, there's three companies that we know of that are, have already started the company after they heard about us to be selling um, digital art and other sort of uh, artifacts like this. So, um, we think that's pretty cool. Um, so, to summarize, um, just three slides left, that's all. So, ownership of digital property, I've talked to you about this, it's a mess, right? Uh, and especially for citizens of the internet, despite being anticipated since the 60s and designed for it. But, you know, the World Wide Web, it went out. Simplicity, right? Original links. And via easy, secure legals, via uh, a terms of service that has embedded um, contracts, and good old Bitcoin blockchain. And finally, this overall, this is about benefiting the citizens of the internet, right? Uh, for, so the creators, 
Now it's easier for them to get compensated because the transfer of ownership is easy and secure. There's actually visibility into usage. Um, now sharing, it doesn't mean losing control, it actually means better engagement. And actually it's a proxy for value. And smart artists are actually starting to figure this out. And, and actually mimicking, mimicking physical ownership as much as possible via contract law. And finally the connectors, right? Now they can actually help their customers' concerns, they can help their creators, they can help their collectors. And it's simply the hook to the API. So I believe that wraps up, yes? So, um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. It's, uh, thank you for your patience, and I hope you enjoyed this.